Welcome to Sports Insider. I'm Dan Lobby alongside Chris Fedor. We've got a little bit of a shorter show for you today, but we're going to pack it full of good stuff. We're going to talk Browns and Indians, and of course, Bud Shaw is here to do his weekly spinoffs. Let's get right to it, because we are now officially a week away from training camp. Yes. Uh, officially getting underway on the 30th. Uh, that's next Thursday. The rookies have reported they're ready to go. We're ready to go. Let's bring in Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter. Mary Kay, how are you? I'm doing great, guys. How are you doing? We're doing well. Mary Kay, let's get the Johnny Manziel question out of the way. <laughs> what, what scenario, aside from injury, could happen that would make Johnny Manziel the starting quarterback in New York in September? Oh, I, I don't think anything. I, I, <laughs> I do think that it's going to be Josh McCown, and I don't see uh, that they're going to really give him the opportunity to try to beat out Josh McCown in camp. In order to do that, you'd have to be taking the first team reps on a consistent basis. Uh, so I think as long as uh, Josh is standing upright and healthy and ready to go, he will be the starter. Mary Kay, should Johnny Manziel have an opportunity to compete for the starting quarterback job, in your opinion? Well, you know what? I mean, everybody has an opportunity you know, to compete to a degree, uh, but mm. I think the approach is a sound one here. Mm. I mean, if, if Johnny really is going to, you know, to shock everyone and, and show that he deserves uh, this job, I think it's best for them to do it under the radar. I mean, last year it, it, was, it was divisive somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was just too much national media attention. Uh, with Johnny coming off rehab, he doesn't need that kind of scrutiny right now. Uh, he just needs to focus on football and getting better. And uh, so I think the approach is correct. And, hey, look, you know what? If he goes out and demonstrates in practice and, and in the games that he's really coming along, uh, you know, by the end of camp, then, you know, maybe – you know, their perception of the whole situation changes somewhat, but right now I, I really don't see that happening. Mary Kay, I think one of the best things so far of this offseason is that we haven't heard a peep out of Johnny Manziel. We haven't had a, anybody talk about Johnny Manziel and what he's doing or what he's not doing. The fact that he has been so quiet and everything's been so quiet around him, I think that's the most positive thing that I've had happen with Johnny Manziel since he was drafted by the Browns. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're so right about that. And especially since the, uh, the water bottle throwing incident, which really sort of turned out to be uh, mostly much ado about nothing. I think it was a little bit of a red flag and maybe an opportunity for some people in his life to step in and make sure that he was staying on the right track. So it might have almost been a little bit of a, a blessing in disguise uh, because, I, you know, I do think that, you know, one, one day during uh, training camp or mini camp, we, you know, his agent, Eric Bur Burkhart, came out to camp. You could see that that people kind of circled back around him to make sure that he was doing all the right things. And we haven't heard anything from him uh, since minicamp. So I think he's got a great support network. He's got great parents. Uh, you know, he's got a good team around him. The Browns are doing everything that they can uh, to help him. And I, 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 think, uh, I think Johnny's working hard at it. Uh, another guy who has to benefit from a quiet offseason and not having national media satellite trucks there all day and an ESPN NFL network there every single day is Mike Patton, Mary Kay, going into his second training camp. Uh, what are you expecting out of Mike Patton? Will he be a little different this year than, than maybe what we saw last year? Oh, definitely. You know, when you look back to last year, I've seen this happen so many times with new regimes. A first-year head coach, they had a first-year uh, you know, a first-year full-time GM doing that job. Uh, they, every, everybody was, you know, in their job for the first time. Jim O'Neill was the first-time defensive coordinator. It was just a, a lot of growing pains that went on. And then there were a lot of players on the team that were uh, having character issues, you know. I mean, that, that's a lot to deal with. I mean, even if you just had Johnny Manziel and you were a first-year coach and a first-year uh, GM together, that in and of itself would have been a lot to handle. Uh, but in addition to that, they had Justin Gilbert, of course, their other first-round pick, uh, who really uh, had a wasted year and struggled the whole entire season. And then you had Isaiah Crowell and Terrence West that, that were having their maturity issues. So uh, I, I do think it was a very tough year. I think they've gotten a handle on all of those things as best they can. And now um, Mike Pettin and Ray Farmer, you know, I, I think that they worked through some of their issues, and we all know what those were as they related to TechScape and whatnot. And I think those guys are on the same page now. Mary Kay, the rookies reported yesterday, the big headliners, obviously the two first round picks. You've got Danny Shelton, the defensive tackle, and then offensive lineman Cam Irving. 
Irving's interesting to me, Mary Kay, because the two best positions for him in college are occupied by the Browns' two best offensive linemen. So what do you think is the plan when it comes to Cam Irving? Where do you think they're going to put him? Well, they're going to start him out primarily uh, at right guard. Uh, And so there he will have an opportunity to Mm. press John Greco for the job. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, when you show up on that first day, you know, who is on that first team offensive line. Has has he already displaced John Greco and they're going to – start him out there on the first team, or they're going to make him earn it and try to beat out John Greco for the job, because John Greco did a nice job last year, and he really has uh, graded out very well at that position. So uh, Cam has, you know, some some battling to do there, and then, you know, there are other places that you can try him at, and you have to hope, from, from everything that we hear, uh, Alex Mack, you know, should be ready to go, but, you, you know, you never really know. Uh, you know, they might ease him into the whole thing during training camp and try to, you know, just make sure that he's getting to the season fresh. And I think you'll see that with a number of guys uh, that will be practicing on a limited basis during training camp. Maybe the, the Phil Taylors and, and um, you know, the Armonte Bryants and some of those kind of guys. Mm-hmm. So I think Cameron will have an opportunity to show his wares at other positions. But I do think right guard is, is where they're thinking of him right now. Uh, Mary Kay, another rookie from last year, a lot of people are keeping their eyes on. Pierre Desir kind of came out of nowhere and uh, got some playing time last year, impressed in mini camps and OTAs. Does he have a chance to move ahead of Justin Gilbert if he has a strong camp? You know what? That, that remains, remains to be seen. I mean, they do think highly of him. And, uh, you know, and he, he has shown uh, a lot of skill and technical ability and those kind of things. So, uh, Justin is going to definitely have some competition, some very good competition at the position. And that's obviously one of the biggest storylines in camp. Because your number eight overall pick from last year, everybody almost forgets, you know, that, that he was the first first round pick hmm. last year. Um, but can, you know, can he come in there and, and get some playing time away from guys like Sermon Williams and Pierre Desir and, and K1 Williams and, and things like that. So, uh, it's definitely something to watch right from the start of camp. Uh, Mary Kay, last question. A guy I'm kind of curious about, Travis Benjamin. Does he mm. make the team this year? I'm sorry. I was in a place where it got a little noisy <laughs> for a second. Can you ask me that again? Do you think Travis Benjamin's job is in jeopardy this year? You know, I really don't think so too much because of the fact that he is a valuable uh, special teamer for, and, and punt returner. So, I, I don't think that, that I would say that it's in jeopardy. And, and plus, you know, that kind of speed, if you can put that kind of speed out on the field and even just send him on some go routes, it brings a dimension uh, to your offense that, you know, that can be difficult to find. And I think coming off his second year now, coming off the, the torn ACL, I think this will be a better year for him in regard to returns and receiving. All right, Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter, a week away from training camp. Mary Kay, thanks for the time. Thank you, guys. I, uh, I don't know about Travis Benjamin. I think uh, yeah, a lot of people talked about Terrence West. Remember yeah. that, that Twitter meltdown he mm-hmm. had when they, when they picked Duke Johnson? Mm-hmm. I think Duke Johnson is a problem for Travis Benjamin, too. If yeah. he can return kicks and, and they start splitting him out at wide receiver. Yeah. That was one thing that I liked about Duke at Miami is the kick return ability, the special teams ability. And you're right. If you just think about the wide receivers – we know that there's no standout guy. There's not that elite wide receiver, the guy yeah. that's going to put fear in the opponent. But there's a lot of numbers here in play. You've got Andrew Hawkins. You've got Taylor Gabriel. You've got Dwayne Bowe. You've got Brian Hartline. Yeah. And you keep going on and on and on. You've got Maley, who they drafted this year. So the question is, how many are they going to hang on to? How much are they going to value special teams? Are they going to try and keep guys who can do like one specific thing? Uh, I kind of agree with Mary Kay just from the standpoint of if you've got a guy with that kind of speed, that's a dimension that Ryan Hartline can't give you. Yeah. That's a dimension that Dwayne Bow can't give you. So having that, that kind of skill set, I think that's important to have that versatility there. At some point, though, you have too many small guys. Well, yeah. And when you've got Andrew Hawkins, who mm-hmm. played well for you last year, Taylor, Ga- Taylor Gabriel, who played well for mm-hmm. you last year, it does become a numbers game. Right. Like you said, and Travis Benjamin sort of becomes that odd man now. Well, Benjamin, the good thing about him is he's small from like a build standpoint, but he actually has some height. I still yeah. remember from last year, if you go back to that Tennessee Titans game, um, him catching that errant pass from Brian <laughs> Hoyer. Yes, I consider that an errant pass. 
I, I didn't think there was any chance that he was going to come down with that football. And then he went out there, and he got it, and he got the feet down, and I'm like, whoa, okay, maybe you're a little bit bigger than I think you are. See, we think he's small because he's always hurt, and he's frail, but he's got a little bit of height to him. Of course you can sit it on an Aaron Pass. Of I'm course. getting the Hoyer train out again. We're bringing back the Hoyer train. That was, that was to, like, <laughs> Jethro in the first row in Tennessee just watching the game, and then all of a sudden Travis Benjamin comes and he grabs it. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and talk some Indians now. Let's bring in uh, one of our Indians reporters, Zach Meisel, joining us. Zach, how are you? Not bad, guys. How's it going? Doing well, Zach. Um, all right, Michael Brantley having a strong <laughs> second half. A big day yesterday, 9 of 19 now since the All-Star break. His slugging percentage since the All-Star break is 947, which is uh, an absolutely huge number compared to what he did in the first half. Did those few days off maybe help Brantley a little bit in that bulky back? Yeah, they probably helped him more than anyone else. Four days off, he you know he missed six games in early April, and then he only missed three more after that before the All Star break. So, the Indians probably, if they could do it over again, would have placed him on the DL in April, and and let him get over it then instead of letting it linger till now. But uh, certainly, four days off seemed to have helped him, and they, there isn't much power in this lineup, and especially when you have guys the guys who do have power and Santana and Moss have so much swing and miss ability that. It's nice to get that kind of production from Brantley. Zach, yesterday with Cody Anderson, did we just have our Matthew Della Vadova moment? <laughs> did Cody just turn back into a pumpkin, or is this just one bad game from Cody Anderson? Not as much to worry about here. Well, look, he's, he was not going to post a 0.89 ERA <laughs> for his major league career, and he's probably not going to post uh, an ERA of 191 for his major league career, which is where it stands now. But this is a guy who, when he throws strikes and he's got good command of his changeup, he's got a really good fastball changeup combination. He could be an effective number five starter. That's all the Indians need from him. So he's made five starts. One of them was a dud. I think the Indians will take that. But, yeah, this is a rookie who only made three starts at AAA. He's certainly far from polished, not seasoned. I mean, it's going to take some time. But when you look at his overall, what he's done through five starts, it's so much better than what Markham and, and – and uh, Chen and, and P.J. House were able to do in that mm. spot that I think the Indians will take it. Zach, that second wild card makes the trade deadline so difficult for a team like the Indians because they're still in the race, even though they haven't necessarily lived up to expectations. Uh, where do you sense they're leaning right now approaching the trade deadline? Buyers, sellers, mm. standing pat, where are they? Well, I, I think they're going to be, <laughs> if, if I have to put, one thing in it, it, it's sellers. But I think they're mostly going to stand pat. Um, they're, they're not looking at this necessarily as just this year. And I think the second wild card does a couple things. Number one, it convolutes the whole, the whole playoff chase because you have all these teams that are a few games below 500. That in any other ordinary year, the season would be over and they'd be looking ahead to the next year and they'd be playing young guys. And instead, you've got all these teams that are kind of just mired in mediocrity who think that they might be able to get to a one-game playoff and then look at what the Royals did last year. Maybe they can replicate that. So, yeah, technically the Indians are in the race, but it's, it's, it's not really a race you want to be involved in. It's, it's, so uh, I think, you know, they might trade guys like David Murphy, Ryan Rayburn, who probably won't be here next year. I think they'll hang on to Micah Velas because – of what he's going through with his family, and, and his family is here with the Cleveland Clinic, I don't think he'll move. So the Indians' options are limited on what they can give up. And the other thing to consider is, sure, you can move Murphy and Rayburn, but those have been two of the guys, two of the few guys who have actually hit for you. And you're probably not going to get a whole lot in return for them. So I think the Indians are looking at this as they'll mostly stand pat. If they were somehow to be able to get an offer for a player signed beyond just this year, and we're talking like a Carlos Gomez or an Adam Lind who hit the Indians really well yesterday, uh, those two guys with Milwaukee. Someone in that nature whose contract goes through next year as well. I think if the Indians didn't have to part with any of their top prospects, they'd be very interested in that because they know they've got this rotation coming back next year. They've got the core, guys like Kipnis and Gomes, Brantley signed long-term. That They could add a guy like that for next year and be in contention next year, but... I think the odds of that are, are dwindling by the day, and I think you'll mostly see this team stand pat. Zach, two other names that continue to come up when it comes to trades. Jose Ramirez, Lonnie Chisinau, both started here with the Major League Club. 
now down in the minors, assess their value from major league standpoint? Well, Chisholm doesn't have a whole lot because he's going to be eligible for another year of arbitration. And I think if, if the Indians still have him, they're going to be asked to pay a few million dollars for that guy. And mm-hmm. if, if you're not going to guarantee him a major league roster spot, it's not worth it. So I think he'd probably get non-tendered and would become a free agent. But Jose Ramirez is not arbitra- arbitration eligible yet. He still has a lot of value because maybe he can be a utility player. You know, he's had basically two tours of the major leagues, and one was successful and one was not. So he's still a good defender. He's, he's still so young. He's 22 years old, and, and he's making the major league minimum. So he's got some value if the Indians wanted to, to, to buy, but he's not a guy that you would say, hey, we're going to sell this kid off for another prospect. Zach, it's that time again. Nick Swisher doing a rehab assignment. Mm-hmm. And so now the question is, what can he possibly give the Indians once he's healthy? You know, to be frank, I, I, we ask about Swisher's progress every day just because it's, it's the daily duties of the job. But anything I hear, I kind of bat an eye at, and I take it with a grain <laughs> of salt. I'm not so sure the Indians are excited or in a hurry to get him back anyway. I think look at his production that he's put up the last two years, and it's it's certainly underwhelming, and you wonder if he can even move in the outfield. You wonder if he can run the bases. And that's before you even ask, can the guy still hit? Can he still get around on a fastball? So, I, I, you know, I don't think – I don't know how much you can add. I'm pretty skeptical. I think the Indians are going to make this a really long rehab process. I know he's going to Akron next. I think they'll make him play a few games there, a few games in Columbus. And then they'll re- reevaluate. And, and maybe if Murphy or Rayburn is moved, you have a spot for him to come back to, and he can play designated hitter. But, again, I think his, his best days, his better days, maybe even his average days are, are well behind him. Zach, I'm with you. When I think about Swisher, and I think I lump Michael Bourne in this category as well, there's just nobody that can convince me that those two guys are two of the Indians' 25 best options. There's nobody that can convince me of that, not with what I've seen. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the only reason those two have a roster spot, or in Swisher's case, will have a roster spot, is because of the salary. And so it really comes down to, would ownership ever just swallow that pill and say, let's cut ties, let's release them. They each have one more year on their contract. I don't think there's any chance they'll exercise the vesting option for the following year. They'd have to get about 550 at bats to pass physical. So if, if you're thinking, okay, these guys are each for next year for about $15 million, mm-hmm. That's a sunk cost. We're going to pay it regardless. You're, you're basically getting negative or zero production from the two guys, and I think you'd be better off playing a guy like, like Tyler Holt or someone in AAA or, or adding someone else. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think it comes down to can the front office swallow its pride and admit it made a mistake, and can the ownership say, okay, I mean, we're going to pay that anyway. We might as well pay a couple hundred thousand dollars more for, for a little bit more production. All right, that is uh, Zach Meisel, part of our Indians reporting team. Zach, thanks for the time. My pleasure, guys. Thank you. All right. A guy who never needs a rehab assignment, Bud Shaw. <laughs> well, thanks, Dan, and, and special thanks for not introducing me as the Nick Swisher of Northeast Ohio. <laughs> That's next week. I appreciate that. You don't have you know, enough energy for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, LeBron James is fresh from a big weekend at the box office with Trainwreck, a movie in which he plays an NBA superstar named LeBron James and speaks of his city, let's call it Cleveland, in terms most of us reserve for the love of our lives. And still, some people say he's not acting. In his real-life basketball sequel, James is the guy we supposedly wanted him to be the first time around. He's engaged. He's invested. He's the reason Kevin Love wanted to be here. He's still a reason why Kevin Love still wants to be here. He's helping shape the roster. More importantly than anything else, he's not going anywhere. So what's not to like? Well, in Cleveland, the answer is that there's always something. But if I ever thought there'd be a snark-free zone, even in that intersection where online anonymity meets Cleveland sports, I suspected it would be a story, kind of a benign story, detailing James spreading his Hollywood wings even further with the announcement that his production company has entered an agreement with Warner Brothers. Here we have James' take on why he wanted the partnership. And even if the story doesn't excite you too much, you have to admit that it sounds pretty well considered. I mean, what possibly could anyone find wrong with this story? Oh, right. Sorry. You know, what they call this thing where people with money 
Lots of money find new and different ways to make even more money. They call it smart business. I realize it's not exactly as startling, startling that an on online comment thread tend to bring out the worst in people, but I still am taken aback at times by the negativity. This picture from a shelter prompted a caring person to rescue these two pups before they could be put down. I'm pretty sure if we ran a story, a first person essay, heartfelt from the guy who did the rescuing, the first comment out of the box would rip the dog on the left for being too needy. Look, is, is James above reproach? Hardly. Are the Cavs above criticism? Never. But I suspect LeBron James will finish his career here and bring a zillion dollars to town that we wouldn't otherwise see. I also suspect that there will be a parade and maybe a statue somewhere along the way before it's all done. Again, as Nick Gilbert reminded us, what's not to like? Eh, I have a feeling we'll find out. The morning after, when the complaints roll in that the parade snarled traffic, and that the statue is attracting pigeons, who, by the way, couldn't possibly soil a good thing as thoroughly as some online comments try to do. Guys? All right, bud. Uh, you know, I've always been convinced that even if, like, the Cavs won a championship and mm -hmm. the Browns won a championship, well, that's never going to happen. But <laughs> if the Cavs won a championship, the next day uh, sports talk shows would be people calling in and talking about, how the team needs to trade for uh, <laughs> Joe Johnson. You know, I don't know if this is generational. Someone else. <laughs> it, maybe you guys can tell me if this is generational. But I have friends close to my age, as hard as that is to believe, some are still living, <laughs> who keep telling me that if the Cavs win, it still won't be the same. It won't be the same as the Browns or the Indians winning a world championship, mm. which I find to be incredible. And I don't know if it's because they did, some of them didn't necessarily grow up with mm. the Browns or, or the Cavs as ingrained in their mm. family life, but you really can't be choosers at this point, can you? It might be generational, though, because, I mean, if you think about it, just from, from my age group and a little bit younger, what do they know of the Browns? Well, they don't know a lot. They know a lot of losing, and, and younger kids usually want to attach themselves with winners. That's yeah. why you see some people with, like, Seattle Seahawks jackets or something like that. Um, for my generation, the Cavs have been the most fun team to follow and Absolutely. the most successful team. And I remember LeBron's first go-around, the Q was the place to be, just like in the mid-90s. Jacobs Field, when it was called Jacobs Field, that was the place to be. It was new, it was fresh, it was hip, it was fun. And I feel like the Q has kind of turned into that for at least my generation. Yeah. I mean, I even have to remind myself at times that 1995 really was 20 years ago. Yes. And that there's a bunch of young people who, right. who are hearing about it secondhand from their, their parents. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the Browns, for, for that age group, what do they have to grab onto? There's really nothing. But for the older people, they can grab onto Bernie, they can grab onto Jim Brown, they yeah. can grab onto Otto Graham, they can grab onto all those things. But if you're a young kid and you're growing up, you want to grab onto dysfunction? Well, that's why I was always so amused when LeBron took heat for being a Cowboys fan. Think about this. Yeah, We've had why, what, what, what happened here? America's team. Yeah, what happened here that should have gotten right. excited about the Browns? We've had high school football players in and out of the studio. Most of those kids, right? My math is correct. If not all of them were born after the Browns left. Yes. Right. So that's, I mean, that should well, tell you. Well, thanks, Dan. You just, <laughs> yeah. made, You're you welcome. just made me feel You're even older than I am. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm also curious to see what happens if the Browns are just terrible and October 31st rolls mm -hmm. around or whenever the Cavaliers open and people start paying attention to the Cavs. Yep. That'll be an interesting uh, scenario. For well, the, the Indians Warriors. will be in the World Series. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, we'll be having the parade for the Indians. There you I go. Forgot. All right, that'll do it for Sports Insider. Thanks to Mary Kay Cavett, Zach Meisel, Bud Shaw. He's Chris Fedor. I'm Dan Lobby. Thanks for watching.